As you have been told and have seen, today is Senior Adult Sunday, and I want to just say, you know, in my years of ministry, um, I have seen different generations, and I have experienced the benefit of those who have passed down a, a, a tradition, a practice, a lifestyle of faith from generation to generation to generation. And I, I would like to just acknowledge uh, those of you that are senior adults, I want to say uh, thank you for your years of faithful service, for your willingness to continue to serve, and just for the wisdom that you are willing to share with all of us. Thank you so much for your faithful service to the Lord. Let's just recognize our senior adults. Um, with that in mind, being Senior Adult Sunday, I think it's appropriate that we talk about the family. I think our seniors could probably share with you that they have seen a lot of changes in their lifetime, right? A lot of, a lot of changes. And even in my lifetime, I have seen uh, things change. I have seen things that I thought would never be challenged, challenged. Uh, one of those being the family. You know, we, we want things that we once accepted as right, as accepted as the only way to do things uh, have, have been changed. Now, sometimes that happens and, you know, that it's a good thing. You know, we find new ways to do things that make life a little easier. Um, but the redefinition of the family does not fall into that category. Yet in my lifetime, I have seen that challenged, and you have seen that as well. We've seen uh, the traditional family as God designed challenged. And so the question that we start with today, uh, I know this, there's a question for the series, but uh, there's a couple of questions that, that come to mind when I think about how things have changed. Uh, first, we know that the Bible defines three institutions that are ordained uh, in the Bible. One of them is the family. That was the first institution that God created. Another is the government. Uh, God recognizes, the Bible recognizes that institution. And then, of course, the church, another institution recognized in God's Word. And the family, I believe is fundamental to the other two institutions. If the family is not right, then the government will not be right. If the family is not right, God honoring, then the church will not be right. Uh, the family is at the core of both of those. In the Old and New Testaments, we see that. So, the questions. Has the family served its purpose? Is there something to replace it? That's what we are told. Is there something to replace it? In this day when everything is changing and being challenged, does society really have a foundation that matters? Because I believe that foundation is built on Christ and it, is, it includes the family as God designed. We're in our series, Modern Life Questions Answered from the Cross. And in this series, the theme, the goal of our series, what we find is that Jesus answers life's most pressing questions from the cross. Questions that we've all, if we're honest, have asked at some point in our lives. Some of you may be asking these questions right now at this moment in your life. And in the last moments of Jesus' life, it's recorded in God's word that Jesus spoke to his mother. He, Joseph had apparently died years before that. He is no longer there. And Jesus, being the oldest uh, male in his family, had the responsibility of making sure that his mother was taken care of. Well, Jesus' life on this earth is coming to an end, so he honors this responsibility, and he does it by making sure that his mother is taken care of. Even on the cross... Jesus recognizes the priority of family. And if you will, turn in your Bibles to John chapter 19. Uh, we will read this, this statement and the surrounding verses in John chapter 19, verses 25 through 27. Beginning in verse 25. 
standing by the cross of Jesus were his mother, his mother's sister, Mary the wife of Clopas, and Mary Magdalene. When Jesus saw his mother and the disciple he loved standing there, that's John, he said to his mother, woman, here is your son, pointing to John. And then he said to the disciple, here is your mother. And from that hour, the disciple took her into his home. What's he doing here? He is dying. And so he is essentially saying to John, John, this is now My mother is now your mother. He's passing the responsibility of caring for his mother to John, the disciple John. He is in the midst of intense pain and suffering. He is thinking about his family. He is making sure that the family is still solid, his family. He is showing us the priority that he had, and as a result, we should have, of family. And there's some actions that I want us to take as a result of this statement of Jesus, but also what we will see in other areas of Scripture, what God's Word teaches us about the family. The first is this. We need to recognize that God is the source of our family. He created the family. Genesis chapter 1, we see him creating the institution of the family, Adam and Eve, putting them together, creating them, putting them together as one, telling them to be fruitful and multiply. He is creating the family. God is the source of the family. And we see Jesus referring to this in Matthew chapter 19, beginning in verse 4. Haven't you read, he replied, that he who created them in the beginning made them male and female. And he also said, for this reason, a man will leave his father and mother and be joined to his wife, and the two will become one flesh. So they are no longer two, but one flesh. Therefore, what God has joined together, let no one separate. In Matthew, in these verses... Jesus refers back to Genesis when God created the family, when he established the first marriage. He's teaching us what he had in mind for man and woman when he put them together as husband and wife. For one thing, we know that marriage provides companionship. He said it wasn't good for man to be alone, so he created Eve. He created woman to go with man and united them together. And within that relationship, we find companionship. God created an equal partner to go with Adam, the man, different roles, but equal, both created in the image of God. And in that relationship, again, we find companionship. Marriage also makes it possible for the continuation of the human race. One of the purposes of marriage is to have kids. Be fruitful and multiply, God told them in Genesis. And so that's one of the things that marriage accomplishes. Marriage is also an illustration of the intimate relationship between Christ and his church. Paul talks about that. The love, the unity, the bond, um, this mutual submission that takes place. The, the love that is agape love, committed, long-suffering, lifelong love, not based on emotion or feeling. The love that Jesus has for his church is the same love that husband and wife should have for each other. And that oneness, that one flesh union, it's interesting, I believe, that what we see in the relationship of the Trinity, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, that the, the marriage should be, the marriage relationship should be a picture of that unity. Now, we're not perfect. We'll never be perfect. Adam and Eve were until they sinned, and now we have all sinned and fallen short of God's glory. But we strive for that perfect unity. God takes two. It's the mystery of marriage. He takes two separate human beings, and through the covenant of marriage, making a covenant with God, a covenant with each other, God takes those two lives and puts them together as one in a miraculous way. And there should be unity 
in that relationship. Just as the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit have separate roles, they are one. And just as we are different people in our personalities and in our roles within the family, we should be one. That's the miraculous union that God created. And in that, we are modeling for the world the love of Christ, selfless love, and also the unity of Christ. God created marriage, and he did it with intent, with purpose. It is a wonderful miracle of unity, and we find fulfillment in that relationship when Christ is at the center of that relationship, when he puts us together and when he is building and growing our family, we find unity and satisfaction and fulfillment. And this brings us to the next action. We should take in light of God's institution of marriage and what he says it should be. We should look to God's word to build the structure of our families. If you want to know how to build a family, God's word tells us how to do that. We see, again, Genesis 1, we see the creation of the family. And in the creation of the family, we see structure in that. We see intent in that. And then Paul talks about this in Ephesians chapter 5, verses 21 through 28. Submitting to one another in fear of Christ, all of us as brothers and sisters in Christ should submit to one another. Husband and wife should have mutual submission, but then he addresses wives. He says, wives, submit to your husbands as to the Lord, because the husband is the head of the wife as Christ is the head of the church. They are equal in their humanity and their value, but there is a, a hierarchy. There's, there are different roles in the family. And then It says, Christ is the head of the church. He is the Savior of the body. Verse 24, now, as the church submits to Christ, so also wives are to submit to their husbands, to uh, their husbands and everything. But then he addresses husbands. Think about Christ's love for the church. He loved the church so much that he was willing to give his life for the church. Husbands, love your wives just as Christ loved the church and gave himself for her. There is no way to misunderstand that. If we love our wives, husbands, the way that Christ loved the church, we should be willing to give everything for them, including our, li- our lives. Verse 26, gave himself for her to make her holy, cleansing her with the washing of the water by the word. We should seek to edify and to, we should seek the spiritual growth of our spouses Verse 27, he did this to present the church to himself in splendor without spot or wrinkle or anything like that, but holy and blameless. In the same way, husbands are to love their wives as their own bodies. He who loves his wife loves himself. So within this, we see roles in the family. All right. First and foremost, Christ is the head of the family. He created the family, and he should be at the head also, though, not just... First, in the list of priorities, he should be at the center of the family, of our relationship, our relationship with our spouse, our relationship with our kids. Christ should be at the center of everything that we do. And then we see that the husband is called, given great responsibility, to be the spiritual leader of his home. In 1 Corinthians eleven thirteen, 13, Paul says, I want you to know that Christ is the head of every man, the man is the head of woman, and God is the head of Christ. It is spiritual leadership that he's talking about here. It is a great call that we should not take lightly, men, as spiritual leaders of our homes. Now, you will not be the spiritual leader You will not fulfill that calling appropriately if you try to be a spiritual dictator of your home. A smart man realizes that, yes, I am a leader in my home, but my wife plays a vital role in the spiritual growth of my family. And if I don't allow her as the leader of my home to fulfill her role in that family, then I will not fulfill my role as spiritual leader. Uh, She leads in our family, and her leadership is just as valuable as mine. It's just different. And yes, I carry 
the weight, the responsibility of being the spiritual leader of my home, but I recognize that we are a team in this. For one thing, I couldn't handle those kids by myself. (laughs) There's no way. But in all seriousness, God put us together with different gifts and different abilities, and we complement one another. And we, we do it together. Not perfectly, but we do it together. That is the model. And it's up to me as a spiritual leader to make sure she can function in her area of giftedness in our family and, the, and, and to encourage her to grow spiritually, to take the lead in praying and, and studying God's word in our family and all of these things. That's my, I carry the weight of that. But she comes alongside as my helpmate, which is, is how the role of the wife is described. And she encourages me and she strengthens me and she fulfills her role within that. Now that word helpmate, unfortunately in our culture, has kind of taken on a negative connotation. But I, I want to share with you how valuable that role So we have, that role is, so we have Christ who's the head, the center of the family. We have the husband who's the spiritual leader, the wife who's the helpmate. Did you know that 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 role, that name, the helper or helpmate, is is the same name that's used to describe the function and role of the Holy Spirit in the Trinity? Now, does anybody here believe that the Holy Spirit is less God than the other two members of the Trinity? No, it's just a different role that the Holy Spirit, it's the mystery of the Trinity, none of us can comprehend, but it is a different and unique role that the Holy Spirit serves as the helper. And that's the idea. She's not less, it's just a different role. I am the leader, but unless she's functioning in her role as the helpmate, I can't function in my role as the leader. So there's structure, there's order in the family. And God is the source of that, and God's word defines that, and we should seek to follow that. Another action. We, need, we should seek to improve the health of society through the strength of your family. If you are worried about the direction that society is, is going in terms of the family, the best thing you can do is begin changing it by strengthening your family according to God's design and instructions for the family. And let me tell you, there are a lot of ways to do that. Of course, being grounded in God's word, having Christ at the center of your family, uh, making God's word a part of your lives. You know, Tony Evans, I'm going to refer to him a few times today. He talks about creating a home where kids are constantly running into God. And everything that you do, God should be a part of what you're doing, even in casual, enjoyable, recreational things, applying God's word to your life, teaching God's word intentionally. But let me tell you a very important component to that. If we're going to teach our kids, if we're going to create this atmosphere, guess what has to happen? I, Mandy and I have to be willing to spend time with our kids. We have to spend time together as a family. And in our crazy, busy society, we have to make that a priority. We have to spend time together. Spend time together with your spouse. Spend time together as a family. Spend time together with your kids individually when you have the opportunity. You cannot replace time spent with your family with anything else. You can't farm that out. No one can take your place in that. You know, there's a story, uh, uh, Billy Graham was at, at the, uh, the Los Angeles crusade that, that was really uh, the launching point for his ministry. It was eight weeks of this crusade, this, these meetings, and it took a toll on him. And, and he was at the, at the conclusion of one of those nights, those crusade nights, some of his family was there. His sister and his brother-in-law had come to the meeting. He, they came up to him afterwards, and, and, and he was greeting them, and he began to admire this baby they were holding, this child they were holding. And he asked, he asked whose baby is that? that? And surprised, they said, well, it's your daughter. Um, he had spent so much time away that he didn't recognize his own daughter. Now, listen, Billy Graham, 
uh, all accounts, lived a life of integrity in a world where we see spiritual giants falling. You know, he continued to maintain his integrity, but even he himself, at being interviewed years later, was asked one of the greatest regrets of his life, and his answer was not spending enough time with my family. You can't replace time. Time goes by. We just spent the weekend with Gracie at, at Union University. She's getting ready to go to college. Time flies by. And if we don't take advantage of the time that we have with our kids, we will one day be saying, I regret not spending enough time with them. Create memories as a family. We are big believers in this, probably so much so that we won't have as much retirement money when that day comes. We take vacations together. We go on fun outings together. We create memories. We are, we are big on having fun together as a family. That's one of the ways that you build a strong foundation in your family, spending time having fun. Work on your marriage. Marriage is wonderful. It is a blessing. It is fulfilling, but it is hard work. And if you don't work at your marriage your marriage will suffer. One day the kids will be gone and you'll be looking at each other going, who are you and do I want to spend the rest of my life with you? Continue to work on your relationships. Spend time together. Continue to date your spouse. Hire a babysitter. Do whatever it takes to make sure that you are spending time just the two of you, even in the craziness of raising children. Men, love your wife as Christ loved the church Make sure she knows you would give your life for her and spend time leading your family. Spend time with and leading your family. Let your wife know that she is loved. Let her know that she is important. Be willing to show her affection. I don't know about some of you men, but I struggle with that. Showing affection, but I'm called to do that. My wife needs that. Show her affection. Be willing to talk to her. <laughs> I use a lot of words. Some of you are shake, nodding your heads. Not just on Sunday morning. If you come by my office, you know, I like to talk. I need to save some of those words for my wife. Uh, she, she wants to talk. She wants to share. I need to be willing to listen, but I also need to be willing to share and to talk. Lead spiritually. Pray with your wife. Pray with your family. I don't know what it is. I pray in front of 200 people. I can do that. But praying with my wife was one of the hardest things I ever did. I'm just being honest. Getting in a habit of praying with my wife. And I think that's Satan's tool. You know, it, it, for some reason that's awkward. But let me tell you how important it is to pray with your spouse. And to pray with your kids. To teach your kids how to pray. That's one of the ways you lead as spiritual leader. And you need to take the initiative in that. Uh, now, I will say that Mandy was vital in encouraging me to do that. Without her urging, the two of us praying together probably wouldn't be happening. That's how she fulfilled her role, but it's my responsibility to take the lead every night when we run away from the kids at a certain time at night. We, we run to our room and they stay out in their corners. I take the lead in making sure that we pray every night. Before we go to sleep. That's my, that's my job. She urged me and I lead in that way. Pray. Do Bible study together. And listen, I will tell you, with kids of different ages, this is a constant struggle. Um, but we need to study God's word and read God's word. It doesn't have to be any in-depth, deep theological study. Just having God's word present and read in your home together as a family. Make sure, though, men, you cannot do this if you are not growing in your faith. If you are not spending time daily in God's word and in prayer alone with him, you will not be able to lead your family spiritually. Men, love your wife, lead your family. Women, respect your husbands. Allow them to lead and support them in their leadership and lead your children and fulfill your role as his helpmate and as mother to your children. Uh, if you don't fulfill your role, he can't fulfill his role. You know, it's, studies have shown, and I, I experienced this and have experienced this with couples, what women want, want more than anything is to be loved and to know that they are loved. They want affection. 
What men want more than anything is to be respected and to know they're respected. And let me tell you, I'm going to brag on my wife. She is wonderful at this. I will fix a sink in the house, an easy job, okay? Uh, I'm not good with plumbing, but I do some of these things. And I'll make a simple repair, and she will brag on that repair like I just rebuilt the car engine or something, okay? <laughs> She is so good at encouraging me and, and showing appreciation, which is really respect that I'm willing to do some of those things. And then she, I, I'm going to tell you something else. If we're going to have the senior adult lunch in a little bit, right? Now, we'll probably be sitting together. But, you know, if, she, if we're at a function and she's sitting at a table full of ladies, let me tell you something I never have to worry about. I never have to worry about her bad-mouthing me in front of other ladies. I've never heard that out of her mouth, and I believe she never has because she respects me enough. Now, we disagree plenty on our own, okay? All right? But I never, ever in our 21 years of marriage have had to worry about her dogging me in front of a group of ladies. That's one of the ways that she respects me. And I try to show her that same respect. She shows respect. And that's what men want. Now, men, you've got to earn that respect, okay? If you're not acting in a respectful way, then you shouldn't expect respect. And what we do that by leading our families and loving well. Couples, strengthen your communication. If you want true intimacy in your marriage that involves emotional intellectual, yes, physical intimacy, and spiritual, communication is at the heart of that. And communication is something that has to be perfected and practiced throughout your life. It has to be worked on. Grandparents, it's senior day. You, have a, you play a vital role in the spiritual lives of, yes, your adult children, but your grandchildren as well. We'll talk a little bit more about the, the generational uh, of impact we can have in just a few moments. But one of the ways you can fulfill that role is to live for Jesus every day in front of your grandkids. Teach them about Jesus whenever you can and in whatever ways you can and pray for them earnestly. Pray for their spiritual growth. And yes, spoil them. That, I believe, is a spiritual gift, <laughs> believe it or not. It's okay. You have earned the right not to have to say no to your grandkids, okay? You said no to us plenty when we were kids. We get it. I plan on doing the same thing one of these days. There's a sociologist and historian, Carl Zimmerman. He talked about the different uh, patterns of domestic behavior that's typified in the downward spiral of each culture. And here's what he said. He said, here's some common characteristics. I won't read all of them, but I'll read a few of them. Marriage loses its sacredness. I think we can see that happening in our culture. It's frequently broken by divorce. The traditional meaning of marriage, the marriage ceremony, is lost. We see increased public disrespect for parents and authority in general. Uh, I mean, how many, when was the last time you saw a sitcom where the dad was, was not an idiot? We make it funny, and then we accept it because it's funny. They, there, there are marketing schemes behind that. There's studies behind that. Continued disrespect. Uh, refusal of people with traditional marriages to accept family responsibilities. That's what we're talking about. We've got to fulfill our roles. Um, increased interest and in spread of sexual perversions and sexual-related crimes. I mean... We could point to several examples of these. How do we combat it? We combat it by making sure our families are strong. And we do that by mom and dad. We fulfill our roles and we pass down a, a, our faith to the next generation. We can turn the tide, but we have to do it beginning with our own families, strengthening our families. The next action, we recognize the effect of our sins on our family. We need to think about our actions in light of how it's going to impact future generations. Exodus 20, verse 5. You must not bow down to them, idols, or worship them. For I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God who will not tolerate your affection for any other gods. I lay the sins of the parents upon their children. The entire family is affected. Even children in the third and fourth generations of those who reject me. Their big problem was idolatry. We've got different forms of idolatry. 
different sins, the entire family can be affected by the sins of the parents. The next generation, even the generation after that. And the sad consequences of ancestral sins can be passed from generation to generation. And innocent children can suffer because of their parents or what their parents or their grandparents have done. Now, in Bible times, it was nothing for three or four generations to be living together. So this, was, this was, had a different um, application. But... The same is true for us. My sins, my kids can experience the consequences of my sins and their kids can experience the consequences of my sins. We need to recognize that we have the power as parents to have either a positive or a negative impact on our children and their children. And so we need to make sure that we are doing everything in our power to have a positive impact and, and so, we need to, next action, build ethics in society as a whole by establishing standards in our family. Biblical standards defined by God's word. Proverbs 22, 6 talks about this. Train up a child in the way he should go. Even when he is old, he will not depart from it. I love how the today's English version says that. Teach children how they should live from God's word, and they will remember it all of their life. They have to make a choice to live by it, but they will never forget it. If we teach our children how they should live. What we are doing, what we should be doing, is teaching our children how to live under the rule of God and his word. In the Old Testament, they were under the old covenant, the covenant of law. We in the the New Testament are under the new covenant of grace, but we are under a covenant nonetheless. And Tony Evans in, in Raising Kingdom Kids talks about this, and he uses a metaphor of an umbrella. I didn't bring an umbrella because I didn't want those of you who might be a little superstitious or like Barney on the Andy Griffith, a little cautious. I didn't want you to be sitting there thinking, is he going to open it inside the room? Because that's supposed to be bad. I don't believe that, but I didn't want you thinking about that. I want you thinking about what I'm about to say. All right. He uses the metaphor of an umbrella. And the covering of God's protection when we are living under his covenant is like that umbrella. I can go outside in the rain and I can open the umbrella and be protected from that rain, right? It's still raining, but I'm not getting wet because of the covering of that umbrella. Now, think about it this way. If I leave my umbrella, which I usually do, leave it somewhere else, even if it's open, is it going to protect me? No. Obvious, right? has to be over me. Let's say, for some reason, I have the umbrella with me, but I refuse to open it even though it's raining. Is it going to protect me? No, I have to open it. I have to have it with me. I have to open it. I have to use it. And the same is true. God offers protection. He promises protection, but he says the only way that you're going to experience my blessing in your life, in your family, is if you are living by my word. If you're following my rules. No, we don't follow rules just because they're rules. We follow them out of love for Jesus, but there are rules nonetheless. So if I don't live according to God's standards, I should not expect his covering, his protection. I'm willfully not opening my umbrella. I'm not using that umbrella. I'm choosing to live outside of God's protection. I have to make a choice. Now, we as parents are called to teach our kids how to use the umbrella. We are called to show them how to live according to God's word, to teach them the truth of God's word, to live it out in front of them so that they see how it applies to everyday life. It, that's what we are called to do. We give them the umbrella by doing those things. Now, it's their job. They have to make a choice to open the umbrella themselves. I can't force my kids to do that, but Tony Evans says, and he's absolutely right, your kids will be far more likely to use the umbrella if you intentionally teach them how to use the umbrella as opposed to if you don't at all. They're not going to know how to use the umbrella. But that's what we are called to do. We are called to pass the baton of faith to the next generation. You want to change our culture and our world, pass the baton of faith 
to the next generation. Teach them how to live under God's rule and under his authority. And we will see that go from generation to generation to generation, which brings us to our next action. We affect society's culture through the spirituality of our families. We affect society. You want to change society? You want to change the world? Begin in your own family. Luke 19, 9. Zacchaeus comes to faith in Christ. And look what happens. We see this in other places in Scripture too. Verse 9 says, Today salvation has come to this house because he too is a son of Abraham. Why? Because Zacchaeus came to faith in Christ and he led his family to faith in Christ. The influence of the Father. I could go on and on about that. I won't, but I could. Passing salvation down to our kids. Tony Evans talks about this in his book, Raising Kingdom Kids. He talks about the greatest thing parents can do is lead their children to Jesus. As soon as your child is old enough to comprehend good and bad, start teaching them about Jesus. Start teaching them about sin. Start teaching them about salvation. As soon as they are old enough to listen and comprehend, we need to be teaching our kids about Christ, about salvation. And then that will give you the opportunity to lead them to Jesus. But once they are saved, we don't leave them to fend for themselves. We need to continue to disciple our kids in the faith by living it in front of them and teaching them how to live for Christ. Evan says this, he says, you cannot outsource this vital component in the rearing of your children. Their discipleship requires time and commitment, even though your time and commitment might be divided among many things already. Church plays a vital role in our spiritual growth. The church is important, but we cannot outsource discipleship of our own kids to youth ministries and children's ministries. They are great helps. They are great supports, and we have wonderful youth ministries and wonderful children's ministries here. We have fantastic children's and youth ministries here. Here, but I do not depend on Wall Highway Children and Youth Ministry to disciple my kids. Do I do it perfectly? Absolutely not. And I've already told you I couldn't do it without this lady down here. But I cannot depend on my church to disciple my kids and teach them about Jesus. That has to be present in my home for them to truly learn what it means to follow Christ. Because they're looking at me more than anybody else in this world. My, Mandy and myself, we live out our faith and we intentionally take time to teach them about Jesus and what it means to live for him. We teach them the truth of God's word and we show them how it applies to everyday life. Focus on the family has an initiative called Gen 3 and it's, and it's about having a generational perspective. All right, Making an impact in my generation, reaching people for Jesus making an impact in my kids' generation, reaching them for Christ and teaching them how to live for Christ, and then grandparents having an impact on the next generation, that third generation. You know, I have the, the, the calling and the ability, the privilege of having an impact by reaching people that, that are in my generation. I've had the wonderful privilege and continue to have the privilege of having an impact on my children, on that generation. And I look forward to, it's getting closer. I mean, I, I've told you all my oldest daughter's about to go to college, right? I know they, that one of these days, 15, 20 years from now, she's going to meet a man and want to marry him. But <laughs> that's the deal we had, Gracie. I'm, I'm sticking to it. But honestly, I look forward to having an impact on my grandkids for Christ. We need to be thinking generationally because our sins will be passed down generation to generation if we're not intentional. We can have an impact either way. Now, I want to illustrate this for you with a wedding dress. All right? Got a couple of pictures. This is Mandy's grandparents, Vicky's mom and dad, at their wedding. And pay attention to the wedding dress, okay? Let's see the next one. This is Vicki, Mandy's mom. 
the kids have asked why Rick isn't in this picture. He says he was there, but he's a hologram. So you can't, I don't know. <laughs> but pay attention to the dress. It's the same dress. Okay, go back to the first picture. Go back to the first one. All right, next picture. Same dress. Been altered, obviously, but it's same dress. All right, now, the handsome couple. <laughs> I want to know how Mandy looks the same, but I look so much older. <laughs> and yes, I'm trying to get brownie points, but you are beautiful. You look just as young today. Boy, we look like a couple of kids there. <laughs> same dress as the previous two pictures. Yes, it's been altered. Three generations. Let me tell you about that, okay? It's more than just a dress that's been passed down in that family. I see it in my wife. I see it in my mother-in-law. I did not get to know her grandmother. She passed away before we met. But I see the legacy of faith that has been passed down in that family. Generation to generation to generation of people passionately, ladies, passionately pursuing Jesus Christ. The dress represents that, but it's about the legacy of faith. That's what I want for my kids and for my grandkids. I want to pass a legacy of faith from generation to generation to generation. And as Tony Evans would say, he talks about passing the baton. At all, that's all well and good unless somebody drops the baton, and then we lose a whole generation. I don't want to drop the baton. I want my kids to pick it up and run the race well and serve Christ and love him passionately. So where does it all begin? You want to know where to begin? I'm going to share with you. Where do we begin? We begin in the womb by providing security in our family. You begin before you ever have kids by building a marriage the way God intended you start with a strong marriage. You build a marriage and a home with Christ at the center. A study from a few years back showed this. The average church has a child 1% of his or her time. The home has that child 83% of the time. And the school, the remaining 16% of that time. Now, these numbers may have changed some, but not enough to be a drastic change. So the church is going to have your kids 1% of the time. You cannot outsource this to the church. They're going to be with you far more than anybody else. Even if they are actively involved in sports and other things, they are still in your home a majority of the time. In a web publication titled Television and Children, Caleb Boyce stated that the average child spends 32 or more hours a week in front of a television, a tablet, gaming devices, or other form, forms of electronic media. That study was 10 years ago. It's probably worse now. I could not find current numbers. 32 or more hours. They're not at church. They're not at school. They're in your home. It begs the question for me and my family, and we should all ask this question. The time that we do have them, are we making the most of that time? Or are we trying to outsource our parenting to some other method or person? Are we making the most of the time? And listen, I know the struggle. I get the struggle with devices and all of that. We live that struggle every day. And a few years ago, we made a decision that we were going to change the way we did things. We still have devices, but we changed the way we use our devices. Our, again, are we perfect in it? No. And I'm admitting to you today it is a constant battle and a struggle because we need them for some things, but we don't have to use them for others. It is a constant battle, but we are determined to win that battle and make the most of the time that we have with our kids. And spending that time intentionally with our kids. In the home, we should provide these things. We should provide safety. Your home should be a safe place. We provide physical protection. We should provide emotional safety. Being careful what our kids are exposed to and what they're not exposed to. We need to make sure we give them love and affection. That's a form of safety. Moral safety. We should have biblical morals that we live out and teach to our ki kids. That's going to put a hedge of protection around them. If they live by those biblical morals, 
and spiritual safety. Jesus should be at the center of our family and he should be present in everything that we do. That's one way we provide safety. We should provide security. And the only true way, yes, there's physical security, but I'm talking about be the only true way to, to, to make your kids feel secure is to be there for them and with them. And for them to know that you're for them, they're there with them and for them. Physical, emotional, spiritual safety and security, and then sanctuary. Our home should be a sanctuary for our kids, a peaceful place. Not without conflict. Conflict exists anywhere. It's how you deal with conflict. But a peaceful place. I want my kids to know that our home is always a safe place to come, regardless of what's going on in their lives. I don't want them running home after they're married and, and, and staying there for the rest of their lives, but... While they're in my house, I want them to know that home is always safe for them. It is a safe place for them. Even if I'm upset with them, I want them to know that I love them and it's safe. And it should be, you should create a self-identity in your home. You're going to contribute greatly to the strength of your child's self-identity. Identity is a hot topic in our culture, right? I need to make sure that I'm teaching my kids, helping them find their identity in Christ because that's what defines them. Not what anybody says about them, not what what they're good at or bad at. Their identity is in Christ and who he says they are. And I want to help them find that. And then self-esteem. As parents, we have the power to build our kids' self-esteem or destroy it. We can encourage our kids or we can discourage them. And encouragement is different than praise. Praise is based on what they do. And we should praise our kids when they accomplish things. But encouragement is far more important because it, Tony Evans says this, he says, encouragement is not tied to what they did. It's tied to who they are. Encouragement relates to their identity in Christ and their inheritance as image bearers of God himself As children of the king. He goes on to say, encouraging your children gives them an expectation of God's goodness and favor on both their todays and their tomorrows. We need to speak encouraging truths into our children's lives. We need to let them know that we want to be engaged and are aware of of who they are. We know their personalities. We should know their hopes, their dreams, and their struggles All of that, let them know that we are aware and encourage them with biblical truths, who they are in Christ, and that it is all going to be okay because they belong to Jesus. We should encourage our kids, and then we should make sure our homes are homes that are defined by salvation, leading our children to Christ, and then helping them grow in Christ. We should desire to give a foundation of faith that builds, on which they can build their adult lives. We give the foundation, we give them the umbrella, it's their job to open it, but they won't open it if we haven't given it to them. Building a foundation of faith. Now, you may be here today and you didn't start in the womb, you didn't start before you had kids and you're sitting there going, what do I do? Start now, wherever you are, however old your kids are, start now. Maybe you're, you're older, your kids are long gone, you didn't do this, you want a marriage for the remaining time the Lord gives you together, a marriage that is blessed by God and defined as the way God wants, start now. You can't go back and change the past, but grace is available and God can give you strength to build your future the way he intends. Start now. Don't wait, because if you wait before you know it, you'll be taking them to Union University and looking at where they're going to be probably, maybe, living for the next four years of their life. And you'll be wondering, man, where'd that little girl in her ballerina outfit go? Start now. Application. 
First, follow Christ. Are you following Christ with your life? Do you know him as Savior? And are you, are you pursuing him personally each day and living for him? Are you teaching your children the word of God? If not, start. Are you helping them apply it to everyday life? Are you creating a home where they're constantly running into God and in everything that they do? Helping them apply the biblical truths to common everyday lives. Are you being intentional about applying biblical truth to your own life and to your family's life? Where do you need to begin? Because, I listen, there are areas I'm preaching this this morning, and as I'm studying this, as I'm going through this study on Sunday nights with other parents, there are areas where God is and has brought me under conviction that I need to work on as the spiritual leader of my home. I'm not exempt from that. And you probably are feeling the same thing. Where do you need to begin? Start there. In building the home that God desires. The family, like it or not, positive or negative, the family is the foundation of our society. If it's healthy, healthy society. If it's biblical, biblical society. If it's not, we've seen what has happened. We have to turn the tide by building our families the way God intended. Let's pray. God, thank you for the gift of the family. Thank you for blessing us with marriage where we find communion, we find companionship, we find intimacy, we find unity if we live and build it the way you intend. Thank you for family where we find love and acceptance and we learn about you in a very unique and personal way, if we build it the way you intend. But Lord, it is constant, 24-hour a day, seven days a week work to build the family the way you want. But we have your power and strength with which to do it. We have to depend on you and submit to you. But we should commit everything that we are and everything that we have to making sure that you are at the center of our homes and that you are being taught in our homes and that you, we are living for you in front of our, our wives, our husbands, our kids. As grandparents, that we are, the, the, the grandparents are living out their faith and serving God and pursuing Christ in front of their grandkids and teaching them about Jesus in word and in deed. Lord, I pray that we would be faithful in this area. Lord, we are called to make you a part of everything that we are and everything that we do. You can't just be at the top of the list. Jesus, you have to be at the center of our lives and our homes. And I pray that we would make that commitment. It doesn't matter what we do as a church in terms of outreach. It doesn't matter what we do in terms of events. We recognize, Lord, if, we, if you are not the center of our lives and the center of our homes, none of that will matter. Lord, may we be committed to building our the foundation in our homes the way you desire and passing the baton of faith to the next generation and then to the next generation and the next and the next and the next. Help us to have a generational perspective in teaching our children about you. Wherever we need to begin, whoever's in this room, Wherever we need to begin, may we commit that area of our family to you right now. In Jesus' name.